o'clock. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this special meeting of the Westfield Board of Education. Tonight is Monday, February 22nd, 2021. We are here holding this meeting virtually in accordance with the governor's executive order. Can we have the pledge from Mr. Moore, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you uh, for the help of my dog. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Moore. That sounded like Cooper. Discussion of the 21 2022 operating budget. Mr. Kazaka. Thank you, Mr. Carey. I'll start with the one question we had from the last budget workshop. And this information was included in the Friday update to all the board members. It was a request for the prior three years of superintendent versus BOE versus town council budgets. I'll just hit some highlights. And then if you have that information in front of you from your Friday update, we can get into a little more detail if you'd like. Going back to the 2018-19 fiscal year, we had a superintendent proposed budget of 59302000 and the BOE approved budget was 274000 less than that. So it was a total allocation of 3.49% increase over the 17-18 budget. We ended that year with a town council adopted budget of 2.97%. So the BOE reduced 274 from the superintendent presentation and the town council allocation required us to reduce just under $300,000. So in total that year, we were looking at about $575,000 from superintendent to adopted budget. And there's a lot of detail within your Friday update. So I'm just gonna go through the three years and then we can go back and discuss any particular year. For the 1920 budget, we had a superintendent and a board of ed approved budget that were the same number, 57,159,000. From that amount, we had a town council allocation that was 1.4 million less than that. And we ended with a year over year decrease of 5.06%, but that was due to the shift of the custodial maintenance operations to the town budget. When you reconcile that fact, we had a year over year increase of 3.5%. And for the current budget, the 2021 fiscal year, the superintendent proposed budget was 57,797,000. The Board of Education went through and made some adjustments, decreased about $84,000, which was a 3.5% year over year increase. And then the town council allocation was $810,000 less than that. But of that 810, we used $625,000 from the 1920 surplus to reduce the health insurance contribution. So that number was a 2.05% year over year increase. For the 2021 year between the board of ed and the town council allocation, we have total reductions of just under $900,000. But again, that number is a little misleading because 625 of that was from the prior year surplus or savings. So if there's any specific questions, we can get into the details of what was reduced, what was added, the reasons behind it. Any board members with questions about that? Sorry, I was looking at it well. And then have my mute off. Um, I just wanted to have an observation. The the reason for those uh, that question for for me was I just wanted people to understand that allocations were not uh, given as readily as people thought, and uh, the board, with our superintendent and his staff and us, had to be very creative to get to where we are today. So. Um, you now you can get a lot of uh, uh, mileage out of uh, a good budget, but it's in tough times, I think we did great. Uh, so the other reason why I wanted that to be brought to the table is that in this proposed budget, 
there are many items that were proposed three years ago that are that have not surfaced again. And you know that concerns me. Um, but yet I respect uh, the superintendent and his team and the principals and staff that has had the input to what we have today. So, um, you know, I, I can support the budget, uh, the allocations, you know, uh, are what they are. And, uh, you know, I just think we have to be very careful um, and how we move forward if we're going to uh, worry about not only the whole child and the progression of education, but also what in this budget is there that is supporting the classroom teacher directly in the classroom. Um, so those are my observations. Mr. John, from three years ago, what are you, what are you saying was in there that didn't get in there? I'm looking at that sheet from Mr. Kazaka. I can't find anything. I'm, I'm curious too. Well, I'll just comment that this sheet only includes what actually made it to the superintendent's draft and then was reduced. There were items that were discussed at the administrative level as far as positions or other initiatives that were not even included depending on what our aggregate number was. So those are not presented here because it never made it to an official draft. But there were discussions at the administrative level of items to add, but ultimately were reduced before even public presentation. But that happens every year, right, Matt? It does to some extent. It, yeah. The last two years, it was very minimal. Prior to that, we had an extensive list that was prepared by building administration as far as staff they need and programs they need. But because of the, the cost, it, it just never made it to public discussion. And just to refresh, just to refresh everybody's memory, those uh, positions included assistant principals at the elementary level. Uh, it included um, restoration of the instructional supervisor positions that were lost. Um, it was additional social work support. Uh, it was additional English language learner uh, teachers, uh, additional special ed staff. And you know, just want to remind the board that in some instances, like let's take for example the ELL teachers, we have been able to reallocate grant funds that we received from the state. Uh, to be able to uh, bring in, I believe it's four ELL teachers over the past, I believe, five years um, to meet the needs of our students. As you know, we have seen a marked increase in the number of English language learners in uh, the community. So this is something that is extraordinarily important. Uh, the other piece that we've added on to in terms of staffing, we've added additional teaching staff in the area of special education. Uh, with our uh, STRIVE program and our ABA program. In addition to that, we've also actually created uh, behavior specialist programs, uh, uh, not programs, but people. These are paraeducator positions that are uh, folks that are actually trained beyond uh, and receive a stipend beyond the uh, typical paraprofessional because these um, paras are working directly with our students uh, and our students that have uh, behavioral challenges. So. We have been able to increase uh, many supports, um, but again, we've been very creative in doing so. Uh, if I had my magic wand, I would have an instructional supervisor for every content area. Um, and the reality is I'd be presenting a budget that's north of 11 to 12% increase. And I know that that's just not realistic at this point in time. And I try and strike the balance between getting the district what it needs and understanding the, the current fiscal times. Mike, I'd like to jump in here for a minute because uh, John's question about um, what is supporting the classroom and have we, and for me, it's have we increased um, the people for ESL? Now, when you refer to we have increased stride, we've increased ABA, and we've increased paraeducators, those are from previous budgets, correct? It's not in this budget. No, it's not in this budget, Elaine. Okay. So I guess I'm looking for, because we're coming back from unprecedented times, I'm looking for, I can imagine, and I have a neighbor whose kid got into private counseling because he be, has become so anxious with this um, pandemic um, about school. And luckily they can afford private. But the point is, um, 
are we going to be, and maybe Elizabeth or John Kazar can help me here, uh, are we going to be prepared for the classroom teacher that's got the meltdowns happening as they come in? You know, we I see the numbers today. I just was looking at them and I forgot to clip on to us <laughs> looking at them. And I see 24 out of 24 in grade six at Highcrest. You know, I don't know those kids, but the teacher in front of them, that's a lot of kids for a high Highcrest classroom. But do we have enough staff, Elizabeth and John, to help the teacher who has a meltdown right then and there and the classes in front of her, the 23 others out of the 24? How, how are we prepared to do that? Um, and I'm looking for, are we, do we need additional on the ground boots people in the buildings to help? I don't know. I'm asking you guys who get to see this every day. But if I know if I was a classroom teacher opening up today in grade five and I got 20 four out of 24 to come in and there would be some anxious kids in there and how are we going to address their needs and are we going to dump it on the teacher to do that I, I want to know that answer is the places in this budget we could get more um teachers no social workers psychologists I know we have one per building but I can't imagine that being okay with the size coming back uh, um help yeah so Elaine, maybe I can answer that in a few ways. I mean, could I use more? I, I would love to have more social workers, um, but I do know there's a cost to everything. Yes. So I will, first of all, I'm going to say my own prediction. Next year is going to be a tough year as we bring back students who have been out of school for, you know, now at that point, it'll be a year and a half. And some students who've never been in school, it, it's going to be a very difficult year. Um, right now, what we're trying to do is think creatively and especially, you know, we have the ESSER money coming in and how to maybe use some of that ESSER money. Because one thing also I worry about is if I hire five social workers, what happens in two years? Do I then, um, you know, end up laying them off because we don't have it in our budget? And so um, already uh, Elizabeth and I have uh, worked, and I think that's the first time I've called you Elizabeth. So Liz and I have worked uh, with some different agencies looking at how we might be able to use them to build our internal capacity and use some of their resources to assist us in that area. I know Mr. Emmett's also uh, one of the company corporations he's also seen at one of his meetings and right. we're bringing them into our ad admin meeting, specifically looking at that tier two and tier three practices and helping us grow our practice while, and I'll say while still in the pandemic, but returning students because yeah. we're an increasingly difficult time. I agree, John, 100%. And I'm glad to hear Mike has shared with you and you shared with Elizabeth that there's some agencies out there. I would not know that. that we, could, we could call on for a year, perhaps, Mike, or six months Correct. if we need people to pay for this. I just can't imagine being a classroom teacher alone at this time coming back it's just overwhelming to me but again, Elena, I I'll, I'll say this because with that agent with those agencies what I'm hoping is it also builds us and looking at things through a different lens yeah we, we are truly we're used to looking through an educational lens and how do we you know help our district look at it through a clinical educational component um and so yeah we need to oh, that's great. That that, that's great, Michael. So there's money in there to go to an agency, Mike, if we needed to? Yeah, Where there are. Yes, Elaine, there are parameters um, that we'll be able to utilize with regard to the ESSER funding that can okay. encompass that. Um, there is a needs assessment. Actually, the administrative team's going to be talking about that tomorrow. We just got it from the state on Thursday. But, you know, we do have a lot of our principals um, that are on the call this evening. And from a perspective of the kids are back and the kids came back in four through six today, K3 is already back. So um, right. Siobhan O'Connor over at Highcrest, could you give us a little update is, in terms of what um, our support staff, like psychologists, I know I was over today and I saw Miss Rodriguez in the cafeteria with the kids. Can you talk about what, what they're doing right now to welcome kids back? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Perfect. So, yep, yeah, we definitely have everyone back. Sixth grade is uh, 68 out of 71 students who are here. So we are definitely full, full in. Um, I would say that, you know, Mrs. Rodriguez and I and my social worker, Sarah Waltman, have all been um, actively engaged with kids and students. Um, we had several students who had a little bit of anxiety just because it's the first time kind of back out of remote. And so they needed some assistance there, but we were absolutely able to take care of those needs, um, working together with them and the classroom teachers, checking in, pulling kids out, um, 
you know, I have to give kudos to all of my staff. They have been wonderful. They, they were so excited, actually, a little apprehensive, obviously, but they, you know, they hit the ground running. We had every single person um, that we needed, I felt. And, you know, the only thing you can't control is parent pickup and parent drop off. But oh. other than that, it was I get stuck in webs. <laughs> yeah, yep. it was a regular day here at Highcrest. And, you know, kids were kids were doing great. I mean, we have to do mask reminders and all those things because some kiddos just haven't been used to that. But we were in school and it was the first day of school. So that was our approach to it. And, okay. and honestly, they, they did great. Okay. And Siobhan, can you do us a favor? And no, your classes, of course, are the biggest over there, which we anticipated. But it, yeah. can you send us a picture and maybe in a Friday update sometime of how that 23 out of 24 looks for social distancing, 24 out of 24 looks? I, I just sure. I, I know those classes, and Bobby does too. And having twenty-four big bodies of the sixth grade in there, I just like to see how we've arranged it. And I'm sure it's a, in line with the the uh, mitigation factors because Mike Emmett wouldn't put those kids in an unsafe environment. But I just was curious to see how that arrangement came out because I didn't. When I looked at the numbers, like they came late, and I went, "Oh my God, that's a lot of kids in a high crest classroom <laughs> size wise, not in a Hamner classroom." <laughs> Well, I mean, absolutely. I think it is a, a lot of students. Our whole sixth grade across the district is large, though. So I think yeah. that it's not just a high crest um, problem. Yeah. Obviously, our rooms are a little bit um, have an odd shape. And so that can yeah. be hard. I mean, I think also we've been pretty, pretty clear in communicating with parents that we social distancing is not our major mitigation strategy. Right. So we're doing masks and we're doing sanitation. Yes. Um, we can and we've been very clear that we cannot be six feet apart here at high crest. Um, yep. But that's been the case for all of our grade levels, just because of our numbers. And you know, knock on wood, uh, we haven't had any school spread as of now. So, you know, I, I think we're handling it really well. Um, when you see the picture, you will not see much social distancing. I think we've been pretty, um, pretty okay. transparent about then, that. Then you don't have time to take pictures. Don't worry about it. Oh, I don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> I already have pictures, Elaine, so you can okay. certainly but, see them. But hey, kudos just to you know you. what to expect. You have a tough <laughs> population up there and your teachers are, are very happy with the support you're giving them. So I'm glad for that. Yeah, Thank we're you. doing great. You're welcome. Any other comments? Questions? Well, Chuck, I have something, but it has to do with the report of the visiting team for the Weathersville High School. And I know Tom Moore is here and um, some vice principals are here. Um, I couldn't help but read one section where we're talking about um, curriculum and they, um, it does not meet the standard and it had to do with budgetary concerns and that really bothered me. Um, let me just read a little bit of it. It says in the past, um, attempts were made to ensure that each curriculum was reviewed and if necessary revised by the way, I can't read everything here. Every five to 10 years, in recent years, the cycle of curriculum review and revision is based on budgetary concerns rather than on educational needs. Now that bothers me a lot because, you know, we just saw the Mars lander and, you know, we gotta get these young people into this 21st century. And if their curriculum isn't even being reviewed so that it's up to date, because of budgetary concerns, that really bothered me. Mm -hmm. um, and well, it's, it's uh, go ahead, Bobby. Right. Dog's got an opinion. The dog. No, not, not my dog this time, not yet. <laughs> um, but can anyone, can anyone comment on it? Um, it really was, it, it, I, I read the whole thing and I, and I marked a couple of places, but that one got a sure. start because right. I, I was distressed about that one. Yeah, let me uh, let, let me take that, Bobby. Um, basically, this this speaks to uh, a period over the last 10, 10, 15 years. And quite honestly, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, the budget has uh, systematically dismantled, right, all that we do in terms of, of curriculum uh, administratively, right? So uh, in the past, we had a curriculum supervisor in literacy, in the arts and social studies, in math and science, in tech ed, in adult ed, in health and physical education. In addition to that, right, we had 
uh, department chairs, not liaisons, but chairs who had 40% of their job dedicated to administrative roles, including curriculum instruction and assessment, right? So if indeed over the course of 15 years, you take away all those administrative positions plus their secretarial support, you take away uh, all the, the administrative um, responsibilities from the department chairs, right? And you basically leave a curriculum department of one, right? I, I, don't, I don't understand what else you can expect, right, but that. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what this is saying too, is that it's all due to budgetary concerns. And um, I know we have a, um, a curriculum specialist and administrator uh, um, in the budget. And I really think it's an app after I read that, and these people go to all the high schools. After I read that, um, I was more than just a little concerned. And I made the mention at a board meeting that I had been at a CREC council meeting. And the first thought as people were talking about budgets and this new administration for equity, administrator for equity, I thought we're falling farther behind. We are, you know, we're, we're like running to keep up and we're falling farther behind. And I don't think that we can do that to our students. Bobby, it was obvious too, if you looked at the data, Mr. Emmerich gave us of the surrounding towns and a number of administrators, we're really lagging behind, mm -hmm. significantly but, behind some of our closest neighbors. Yeah. Chuck, this is Ken. I, if, if I can, I wanted to ask a question about that. Go ahead, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, I wanted to follow up with that and first off a comment and then a question about that the comment is this may be the most important budget that many of us has worked have worked on because of covid we have so many needs and unprecedented times and our ability to meet those needs next year uh, through this budget process is critically important and again perhaps more no, not more important more important than any other year but my question i think i asked michael for that information on the administrators because we always get that kind of feedback. Oh, do we need more administrators? And the data clearly shows that we have a lot fewer than our neighboring towns. Maybe you can just run through like ours against Newington, Michael, and then uh, related to that, how it actually helps the classroom teacher. Because I think Elaine's point about getting as much help to the classroom teacher is really important and something I'd like to focus on. And I know those two positions, the director of uh, uh, curriculum uh, supervisor and special ed will really help the classroom teachers. So maybe you can focus on a little bit about those numbers. So people uh, here in the public and our friends on the town council, um, and as well as how it helps the classroom teacher. Yeah, Michael, yeah. I did some math. Do you want me to share what I got? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Rocky Hill has less students than us, but the same amount of administrators. Newington has 10% more students, but 50% more administrators. And North Haven has the same amount of students, but 10 more administrators. So I know North Haven's an outlier, but they're still in our derg. So, but there's yeah. some startling data there. Yeah, and, and Ken, just to your point with regard to what, what do administrators do? Um, administrators are critically important in helping to support what goes on in the classroom. And let's take, for example, the instructional supervisor for, um, for literacy or for math. These are people that are working directly in classrooms. Uh, they are working and coordinating with um, outside entities such as Columbia to engage in professional development. I mean, let's face it folks, at one point in time, we had four of our schools that were project schools with Columbia. We had embedded professional development at elementary schools as well as even our middle school. Um, and these folks would come in directly from Columbia and would work with our staff and would work with our students. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, you think about it from a perspective of, you know, STEM and having a science coordinator, um, it just doesn't exist anymore. And as Tom mentioned before, you know, we currently have the liaisons. The liaisons came about after we had eliminated the team leaders at the high school level because of previous budget cuts. The liaisons are, they have a, a leadership role as part of a leadership team there. But as Tom mentioned, with the department leaders, they had a reduced schedule. And with the liaisons, they do not have that. So th that's the difference there. And from a special education side, you know, where did I see Liz Freitas today? Liz Freitas was over at Webb Elementary School 
She was in the pre-K supporting teachers and staff, and she was in the ABA classroom supporting the uh, behavior specialists as well as the teachers. Um, she's a go-to person. She works directly with parents and families. She provides uh, technical support with her expertise. So, you know, I think it's important to look at administrators as being a support for teachers. Yes, administrators evaluate. There's no two ways about that, but that's not what our only sole purpose is. It is really to provide support, whether it be resources, budgetary management, you know, to get teachers what they need, and ultimately making sure that our kids have everything they need to succeed. And Mike, can I um, just go beyond the uh, evaluation to coaching? Because sure. we do, you know, state guidelines, we have to follow our evaluative timelines. But more important than that is coaching. Working with our teachers, because it's no longer with the teachers in isolation in their classroom. And so it's working with them to, you know, have them ask us questions. And I'll say like for the past three years, um, Liz and I have used um, and gotten a grant for an executive coach. What valuable time that is to sit with somebody who questions us how we're doing, why we're doing, to really sit there and spend the time with us. I would love for, you know, more of our teachers to be able to do that. Not as the evaluation process, as a coach that's sitting there with them and really, you know, helping them guide their practice. Great points, John. Thank you. And, and thank you, Michael. All set, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Any other comments? All right, Mr. Kazak, I believe we had a question about the AD position at the high school and the costs around that. Oh, for making another full time and in, in making another assistant principal there. Yeah, the athletic director position within the WASA contract for an AP, which we don't have a designated AD within the contract. So that would be an MOU, but I'm assuming it would be very similar salary structure. But for next year, the AP position is 118 to, I believe, 144, depending on which step. Are you so, talking full time, Matthew? Correct. Full time AD. I heard that correctly, right? Yes. 118 to what? 144. According to the uh, it's a, a principal's contract, you would fill in, fit in that group. Yes. Or he or she. Correct. And then it would be minus a by half a vice principal, correct, Matthew, at the high school if he took the full time? Well, I'm just commenting on the cost of a full time, full -time. administrator. I don't know what structure we're suggesting. Okay, got it. Elaine, I think the question was, and I posed it the first meeting was, if we, instead of the 712 supervisor, what would be the cost of making a full-time AD and then hiring a full-time assistant principal at the high school? Okay. But it would be more yeah. cost. It would cost us more. Yes, of course it would. There's two people. And, and a full-time assistant principal? Is that what you're Correct. Talking? To help with the instructional leadership and curriculum that, they, that we're trying to fill the void okay. with. The, uh, the model that we previously had was a, a principal, two assistant principals, full-time AD, who was also the uh, curriculum instructor for health and physical education, uh, and then a dean of students, which uh, was uh, at one time Michael Verderam, it was one time Emily Daigle, right? And it really served as a, uh, a proving ground, right? Kind of growing our own administrators, right? So that was the uh, model that that was in place uh, previously, right? And then again, through budget attrition, right? We have a um, integrated assistant principal slash uh, athletic director, which as I've told Mr. Emmett many times is two full-time jobs, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. He does a, a fabulous job, but yep. it truly is two, two full-time jobs. Yep. So and this, this change folks dates back to 2011. You're going right. back 10 years when this happened. Yeah. Um, so I guess I need clarification again, Matthew. Um, do we have the money in the budget for a full, this present budget we're looking at, full-time AD, or we don't have it in there yet? We do not. Okay. And we do we have what Chuck's suggesting, a full-time vice principal in there, or we do not yet? We have a curriculum supervisor position proposed instead of okay we have the money for the curriculum okay so they're they're going hand in hand the money okay sorry guys i just have to do this my own self <laughs> well, questions thank you elaine 
I don't run the money in this house, needless to say. <laughs> <laughs> Any other <Talk>. questions? <laughs> I heard my name, I think. No? Nope. Okay. Any other questions, comments? The ultimate goal tonight is to be able to give Mr. Emmett our straw poll on what budget to present in two weeks, what number. We've heard a lot of good information over the last three nights to help us be more informed. Yeah. But we're not adopting anything tonight. So ultimately, it's to give Mr. Emmett guidance on what superintendent budget to present in two weeks. And then we can have discussion even that night further. And then it'll become our budget once we adopt it. Well, I need to digest the new stuff on the table. Um, I think that's great, the full-time AD and the full-time principal. I'm just looking at, but I, the very first, maybe I'm crazy here, but it was the very first time I, I heard that on the table. Anybody else have comments to that? I, I, I yeah. just want to clarify it. I didn't find it as a, a full-time um, vice principal. It was a curriculum. Right. That's the other piece, but they could swap um, it to a vice principal that and money, right? You, after you read that the school visit, yes, I did. They yeah. need they need somebody um, full time there for curriculum. They do, and that would be a curriculum person just for seven to twelve, right, Mike? That's that correct. Secondary. Yeah, yeah, because that's the other thing, Elaine, I, I certainly don't want to leave the middle school out. And, you know, when you think right. about it, we have the curriculum specialists at the elementary level, um, it, you know, that seven through 12 administrative piece, you know, you talk about articulation between middle and high school, that's critically important. The other thing we'd certainly consider with regard to that uh, instructional supervisor, very much like we've done with the supervisor of technology, um, Sarah, Sarah is actually based out of Wethersfield High School. So yeah. I would look to make that administrative position probably school-based as well. So that it's somebody who's out in the field. Now I will say, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, I would imagine that although you are K-12, you get a lot from the high school. Am I correct oh. with that? Absolutely, yes. But they didn't put her in hand there, huh? She'd have so, a lot yeah. to me. <laughs> so we're gonna, and that's, you know, that's one of those little, those administrative nuances we're gonna have to make sure that we're, we're clear on is that the, you know, the expertise is shared uh, with this particular position, seven through 12. Um, I would say, obviously, if you were willing to add, you know, that's a terrible word to say, I but if, you, if you're willing to add, add an additional, you know, position to be able to parse out the athletic director from an assistant principal, and we have one standalone athletic director, a standalone assistant principal, and we still maintain the uh, instructional supervisor for seven through 12, you know, I would obviously support that. In terms of the, the the reality of what was most important, I brought yeah. forward the instructional supervisor seven through twelve, based upon the NEAS report and the needs I know we have at uh, South Sea Middle School. And you envision that person being a lot of boots on the ground. Okay, can I request something? Teachers. I, I do expect that, Chuck. I, I'm not looking for somebody that's going to sit in an office. I want somebody oh, that's going to be no. out. And, and again, you all need just look at Sarah Harris. Sarah Harris is out everywhere, uh, very visible out in the buildings, supporting teachers. And you've seen that, you know, let's go back to last March when we uh, developed a remote learning plan in the span of about uh, 12 days. Sarah yeah. was critically and important working hand in hand with teachers. So I envision the curriculum and uh, instructional supervisor doing the same exact thing. Mike, is there a job description for this curriculum sub instructional supervisor that you have in mind? Yeah, we um, we actually in last week's presentation, uh, Sally and her rationale provided some of the, uh, the global that. the global pieces. Um, if this yeah. was something that we would uh, uh, receive approval for to move forward on, we would fine tune it and hone in, and actually through the HR committee, would uh, delve into that piece and come up with some real specifics. Well, I'm only going to prove that if I'm I'm assured from you, Mike, that this person is not a sitting up in the Stillman building and out on the grounds like Sarah is. That would be wonderful to me. Mm -hmm. And if you give me that go, then I will go with that because um, you always put the kids first. My 10 years on here. <laughs> oh, and that's not changing, Elaine. And I'd like to add to that, Chuck, if I may, uh, you know, a uh, special ed person too, because we're, we're leaving hopefully soon a time that you know will never happen again we hope 
Um, this pandemic has left a lot of children with trauma, with apprehension. There's a great article that went around on Facebook and a mother finally called her son he, that he was a superhero. Yeah, because I saw that. These kids are just um, beside themselves. They, don't, they really don't know what to do. Um, and I think having special ed boots on the ground again um, will help us a lot with these teachers as they face these kids who just aren't used to school again um, and who are used to, um, I don't know, alone time. I mean, they haven't been social creatures for almost a year. That's a long their time. Their natural way of learning has just been disrupted. Mm -hmm. disrupted. They're social beings. You look at the it's pyramid of life. They come from survival to social, you know? So, but Michael, in both cases, I feel that they need to be present in the classroom. So, uh, or, you know, like Sarah does. And so I can't support, I can support a supervisor in both like we proposed. And I'd even like to make it Mike Maltesi full time if we could find money. I'd like those three things in a perfect world, but, um, I don't want any positions, Michael, that sit up in Stillman. You don't even sit in Stillman. You're out for there when the gas leaks come, you know, and you're the head of the whole place. So <laughs> I just want to make sure that your word is that you're going to get these guys in the classroom if we approve them or helping teachers. I shouldn't say in the classroom, but helping teachers. And that would make me feel very good about this. Okay, Chuck, you're up. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? So Chuck, how do we discuss this as a board? Are you gonna call a Zoom meeting for all of us? No, I mean, we've not, in the past, we've just gone around and said, and said if anyone had any issues with 2.7 and that was it and we talk about it. But I don't want Mike to present to town council, not what we've approved. We've only approved a number you're saying. Correct, Mike, right, but, should... So he's gonna present his budget to us in two weeks. Okay. Officially. Which would be a correct what, Whatever we decide on here was is always the way it's been done, Elaine. But the theory is once he proposes his budget to us officially on that Tuesday night, we can make changes to it because it's our budget. So okay. you can make changes okay. to it that night and you can make changes if the town council appropriates different money. Those okay. are the only times we can make changes to that budget because it's our budget. I think the nine of us need to talk because I'm sharing my thoughts out loud here, but I don't know what everybody else is thinking in terms of um, the sure, special ed supervisor and the curriculum supervisor and maybe a full-time AD. So I need to hear from other people for Chuck well, before I can. I just said it is, as long as it was boots on the ground. And Me too. And, and I know your like thoughts because you said it. <laughs> But I wanted to make it, um, a comment about evaluations too. Yes, these people will be evaluators, but we've gotten away, I hope, from any kind of punitive evaluation and we're more into getting, giving people feedback. And I would assume Sarah Harris would be great at that if she's running around with the computers trying to get everybody up to snuff in this new remote age. Um, but I think that's what we need to, we need more boots on the ground, but they have to be given teachers feedback. And then Elaine, you get your both teachers help and we get the yes. administrations that we're falling very behind on, which is yeah, really with you, but, but see, I can hear your opinions now. Hmm. I, need I said it before. <laughs> Matt, well, could you give us a rough estimate on what the cost would be if we made Mike Maltesi whole and then what would be the entry level for an assistant principal so mike is already in there for his 1.0 fte oh yeah so you just have to tell us what it would be for an assistant principal so thank you if you hire someone at step one 118 118 no okay what would you call that as percentage with benefits well, let's just say two person benefits and add in, you know, some of the other minimal fringe, call it another 20 grand. So 140. One, yeah. So you're probably going up a quarter, quarter percent. Quarter percent. Okay. Any other comments? 
I mean, I support the 2.7. I mean, is that what we're just waiting for us to say? Because well, I, mean, I feel like I guess, I mean, everybody's saying right <laughs> if we can do 2.7 too. I don't know <laughs> to get some of these other positions. I, I you know, I obviously support that too. I do think it's going to be challenging. I do think it's going to be challenging um, to get the uh, town council to sign off on anything more than that, in my mind. Um, but I'm all, obviously all for the special eds positions. I'm all for, I'm all for the teacher support. I mean, you know how vocal I am on all of that stuff. So Mm -hmm. I just figured I wanted to get the ball rolling with kind of what they put out in front of us. If, you know, if Mike thinks that that's kind of adequate to kind of get us moving forward, then that's what I support. And I missed the first meeting. So I kind of missed all of the information about any sort of additional funds we get um, from the kind of pandemic response and what those can be utilized for. I'll follow up on that separately. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping there's additional support for some of the critical issues happening in the district. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Mr. Riley, you had your hand up? Yes, I mean, I certainly support, uh, you know, the special education. My son certainly would benefit from that. Uh, the curriculum position, I think I agree with everyone else that we need someone that's working closely with the teachers in the classroom. We don't need someone, you know, that's sitting somewhere supervising. Um, so I, I agree with all the other comments that have been made. Excellent. Anyone else? I'm no. supporting 2.7. Yeah, I'm good with 2.7. I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm good with 2.7 as well, Ken, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm also supportive of the proposal that you've mentioned and the positions mentioned and the uh, guidelines that it seems to be the group consensus on how they're to be used. Okay. Now, but Matt, if we went to a, a vice principal and an AD, that would be more than 2.7. Yeah, it's about 3%, Bobby. You said 0.25 oh. more? Yeah, right around there. What percent was that? I'm sorry, with a VP and AD? About 3% or right around the 3%, give or take a few tenths. 3%. We say 3%? That's just. Yes. Oh. I'm more comfortable with Michael's recommendation of 2.7. I brought the AD up as a, as a swap out for the curriculum specialist, not an add on. So. I gotcha. If we can get the curriculum specialist, I'll be thrilled. Correct. Right. That is so needed. If you read this, which I hope everybody does, you so need a curriculum specialist up in that um, high school. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that's the battle we have to choose, right? Is this, that, that's what we need first and foremost. So if we add too much to the water, you muddy the waters, in my opinion. I don't disagree with you. I think we need to focus on curriculum specialists, special ed support, all of those other things we mentioned. I mean, it would be great, a perfect world to add that as well, but I feel like I'm comfortable with the two points. Yeah, I think the word comfortable is good. Yes, agreed. I like comfortable. I'd be interested in knowing, I think I asked the same question last year to Michael. Had Chuck not brought up the switcheroo at the high school, what, to the question of what next, you know, after curriculum and special education, what would be your next plug into the budget? It would be in terms of, from an administrative perspective, it would be additional curriculum support, Lou. It'd be additional, whether it be science, science and math, uh, something K-12, you know, we used to have uh, K-12 reading, literacy, we had K-12 math. So it'd be additional curriculum broaden it across uh, some of the other content uh, areas, Lou. That would be what I would say. Uh, again, going beyond the administrative ranks, what I'd love to be able to see down the road is additional special ed uh, staff at the elementary level. Right now I've got a uh, two special ed teachers per uh, elementary school. So that's three grades each. I'd like to add additional. So, you know, you're talking about 
know, another 15 positions. Um, it's a lot. Uh, I'd like to add additional social work at uh, Silas Dean Middle School. I mean, I, I can I can keep going very easily, uh, but the reality is it's it really is trying to strike that balance. And right now, with regard to the to the need, you know full well we've added a lot of um, special education programming, and which has saved this district and town a significant amount of money. While at the same time keeping our kids and our families here in Weathersfield, that's huge. Um, we just need that additional support at the administrative level to support John, to support Liz, and most importantly, to support these programs and the staff and the kids in them. Thanks for the question, Lou. Yeah, can I just throw in one thing here, um, if I could? And you know, we're also uh, in the midst of, through John's hard work of, of um, moving forward with uh, building support in the community for the uh, repair and renovation of our elementary schools. So I, I do think it's important for us to uh, keep this budget at the level we suggested. And you know, I think we all understand how much we'd like to have, but I think the, these investments we're making are for the most critical needs. There's gonna be a lot of ups and downs with evaluating the impact of COVID on us, but nothing's going. one thing hasn't changed and that's the need for us to fix these schools sooner rather than later. And I think it, help, it will help us in that, uh, in that persuasion campaign that we're going to need to do to, to get this over the finish line. And that's my only other observation about that. Thank you. I agree with that, Chris, too. That makes sense to me. Thank you. So two sevens good, it seems. Yep. I'm Mr. good. Mr. Emmett, you'll be all set then for your, in two weeks. We absolutely. Got, we got you in a good spot. Yep. I think that's absolutely perfect. So we'll have a presentation prepared for the board uh, at the March 9th uh, Board of Education meeting. At that point in time, any further questions or final follow-up, uh, you can certainly partake in. The expectation would be the board would then vote on that budget. Upon approval, it becomes the Weathersfield Board of Education approved budget. And Matt and I would then transmit that budget uh, to town council by the charter date of March 15th. Um, and then Chuck, I would expect you and I would be uh, presenting that budget before town council right after that in mid-March. Correct. Mr. Emmett, is there anyone on the phone to make public comment? There is no one on this evening, uh, Mr. Carey. All right, well, it was worth a try to get some public comment, maybe when we're in person next year. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? No. So moved. So moved. Uh, second. Second. Thank you. I know it was Kelly who seconded it. Ellen, I have no idea who motioned it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, admin. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank everyone.